So, hey guys, are you frustrated with where you're at right now? Maybe stunted in your progress? Well, if you are, I want to recommend a place for you to go called Growth Day. Growthday.com forward slash ed. It is the number one personal development app on the planet. It's got all kinds of high performance techniques in there, courses, accountability, journaling, live speeches from some of the top influencers in the world, including me. It's an overall environment to change your life. Growthday.com forward slash ed. When you have a worth level or a confidence level that you can achieve something, you're far more resilient than when you don't have that. There's all these tools on confidence that everybody teaches, right? But I had a really profound experience when I was young that changed my life. And, and, and it, I've never linked my ability to build a habit or my confidence to my skill. Just stay with me, even though I built great skills. I won a contest in Hawaii. I'm 28. I'm running down the beach in Maui. Running the other way, and that is why you get rewarded for getting up before the sun. Running the other way is this bald, kind of can see he's got a hairy back. He's sweating. He's running towards me. And he's wearing a Sony Walkman. I'm wearing one, too. That's how long ago it was. So we're listening to cassette tapes while we're running, <laughs> right? And so he runs by me, and it's Dr. Wayne Dyer, Whoa. who's a hero of mine. And I said, Dr. Dyer, you changed my life. And he turns around, he has a deep voice like I do. He goes, well, I highly doubt that. <laughs> he goes, I'm sure you changed your life, but what did I do to help you? And he walks towards me, and we sit down on this beach together. Whoa. And for 90 minutes, I watch the sun come up with Wayne Dyer. And he gets to know me, and he's pouring into me. And at the end, he goes, Ed, you're going to change the world. How old are you at this point? 28. Wow. He probably said this to some other people, right? And he goes, I just think you're brilliant. The way you can articulate your thoughts, your viewpoint on personal development and changing oneself, your experience with your dad, you're going to change the world. And he goes, and that's not why. And he goes, it'll be very dangerous for you to attach yourself to your abilities the rest of your life. Wow. I said, I don't understand. Like, if I can't close or persuade, I can't close a sale. If I, he goes, no, no, I want you to have all those things. But if you would attach your identity or worth to the external, it's fleeting. That's why so many pro athletes, when their career's over, they don't know who they are. And I said, well, then what do I do? And he goes, what's beautiful about you, Ed, is your intentions. You have beautiful intent. And I knew that about myself, was my intentions. And what I didn't know is he was writing a book at the time called The Power of Intentions. Mm. And he goes, would you please, please, because you, you have the talents, would you please attach your confidence and your worth and your identity to your intention? When you walk into a stressful environment, remind yourself that you intend to serve, you intend to give, because you may lack the ability sometimes, Ed. You may lack the answer sometimes, but you'll never lack the intent. And that intent will put you in a state where you can find the answers. Brother, all my life, most of my confidence has come from driving here today. Mm. I just intend to help people. I intend to make a difference. I don't like that, oh, I don't need to be here, I'm rich already, forget all that stuff. My intentions are to help people, forgetting my current status one way or the other. And so I would recommend everybody to take a real look inside you. What are your intentions? Your intentions to make a difference, your intentions to love people, your intentions to serve people, is your intent to serve your family, is your intent to make a difference? If that's the foundation for your worth and your self-confidence, you'll never have to chase it again. If it's something aside from you, a skill I gotta get, a talent I gotta get, I gotta get this, you'll be chasing it all of your life. Now, having said that, I have a chapter on habits and how to develop them and how to create a trigger and how to create the, the, the behavior and then how to have a reward when you do it. So habits are created by triggers, then there's the behavior, then there's the reward, and I talk about how to build those habits. But all of that is, is really not very productive if you don't have some internal knowing that you deserve to be successful, that there's a worth to you, that a confidence that exudes from you. And I don't think that's where my sister and I are that dissimilar. Externally, we're very different people, right? Different careers, different paths. But I think my sister, maybe it's even unconscious, doesn't even do it intentionally, no pun intended. She knows she intends to serve those precious children every mm -hmm. single day. So she walks in there with a confidence that's bigger than her lack of vision her lack of being able to see. And I think these students sense this beautiful intent on this woman. And because she's self-deprecating, she has this overwhelming intent to serve. There's not a lot of backlash or poking fun at her. And I, in my life, I haven't had a lot of that, to be honest with you. I've had far less resistance from other people because I carry my intent with me everywhere I go. Talk to me about state change. So you mentioned like you going into a stressful event, mm -hmm. remind yourself that you're there to serve, and it, it does switch something pretty profoundly. Mm -hmm. What is a state change? How do you do it? Why does it matter? State change is the definition of everything that I do. So what I do when I'm in a good state, when I'm in that moving state, whether I'm training and working out or I've crushed a podcast or I've crushed a show, 
I create a physical anchor. So I link the emotional state to the anchor. Emotional state to the anchor. It could be you can tug on your shirt, you can pull on your right ear, you can snap your, you've noticed probably 20 times through this interview, I snap my fingers. I associate you with the finger snap more than you could ever possibly okay. imagine. And so for me, that's the juice. And so when you get to a peak state, link it to something physical. The more repetitive it is and the higher the emotional state. That's why, for example, you have them in reverse. If you've ever walked into a room where something bad's happened or hear a song or something, it Im immediately creates a trigger for you because the emotional experience was so high. Mm -hmm. First time you did the naughty, naughty thing, if there was a song <laughs> playing and that song comes back on, you go right back to that place, don't you? So there's an emotional heightened state and then something physical that happens. And so in my case, when it's going really good and I'm pumped and everything's great, I link it, I link it, mm -hmm. I link it, I link it. And so now, then you can reverse it back where that trigger creates that state. This is really not that complicated. I go into it in the book. It's amazing to me that we all have all these unconscious triggers in our life, whether it is a song or a room or a person or a memory or a whatever, and yet we don't ever take control of them. We know they happen because they happen to us all the time. So all I've done in my life is I said, okay, if that's the case, I'm gonna create a few that serve me. And by the way, the ones that, you can already hear my energy just went up. The reason it serves me is it can override the negative state. It's my pathway out of the dark space. It's my pathway out of fatigue. It's my pathway out of confusion. It's my pathway out of not knowing the answer to something. Mm -hmm. I all of a sudden become a heck of a lot more resilient when I'm in that state. And I've got like four or five of them. I just did another one of them, right? But I've got four or five physical things I do that I've linked. If you're an athlete, when you make a big putt, link it. You make a big putt, link it. You make a big putt, link it. When you're in meditation, even in meditation, when you've emptied your mind, if you can just create a trigger that can take you back there, then you don't need to be legs crossed, quiet, mm, every time to feel that feeling. It's one of the things not talked about in meditation because we're supposed to empty our mind. When we're done and the mind is no longer empty, just create a physical trigger. Just You ever have someone in your life, just when they touch you, you feel, Lisa touches you, you feel different. Lisa is a trigger for you. No doubt. Of comfort, of confidence, of whatever, ecstasy, whatever it is. So these things are around us all the time. How about we start to take control of them? How about we start to be, no pun intended, intentional about them? So heightened state, physical trigger. Heightened state, physical trigger. Do it repeatedly, and you're gonna find yourself a different person when you need to change your state. I wanna repeat that. You're gonna find yourself a different person when you need to change your state. That's the, the thing about state change for me is I don't feel like the same person. Like if I get into a negative space, mm -hmm. I feel weak and unsettled, and then I can literally, I will, one of my sort of internal triggers that I use is the phrase, remember who you are. There you go. And just saying that to myself, I'm like, that's right, remember who you are. There was this incredible 90s cartoon, Batman cartoon, and there's this episode, I love this, I think about it all the time, where Bruce Wayne gets put in like an internment camp basically, and he can't get out, and then he, he has amnesia. Mm -hmm. And then one moment, I forget what happens, but he remembers that he's Batman. Nothing changes. Love it. He just remembers that he's Batman, and all of a sudden he can escape. And I was like, God, you have to, that's a state change. That's a state change. Just remembering who I am. Who you really are. And here's why that's important. Let me throw something at you that I think you'll agree with. That's who you truly are. But all of us are different people in different times, in different mm -hmm. circumstances. And so it's a matter of pulling, this sounds hokey, but it's about pulling the most powerful, yes. resourceful version of you out. I'm a very different person. There's, there's like 30 Ed Milets. There's the Ed Milet when I'm really down and I wake up in the morning and I'm, I got anxiety first thing I wake up. There's the Ed Milet when I'm with my kids. There's the Ed Milet when I'm on a stage. There's the Ed Milet when I'm doing this. There's the guy driving in the car. You all have these different versions of you and you know that you do. So the question is, when the one shows up who doesn't serve you, can you bring out the one that you really are? And so it's this notion that this is who I am, really? You're the same person all the time? You have the same emotions all the time? The same thoughts all the time? The same energy all the time? Of course you don't. There's many versions of you. Someone like Kobe Bryant, when the world was melting and he's going to Colorado in his trial and he's, he somehow could find a way to get on that court on a Wednesday night in the middle of all that turmoil and the black mama shows up. Mm. And all the people we admire in our lives, if you really think about it, when all the pressure's on, they find a way to step forward with the best possible version of who they are. And that's what separates them. It's not that they don't have the weaker versions, the lesser versions, it's that they can pull the right one forward when they need them because they've either created the tools. Athletes do it very naturally. Tom Brady, let's effing go! 
Why does he say this out loud? It's like ridiculous, right? Peyton Manning, Omaha. These are triggers. They might be an audible, but it's also a trigger that creates a state where he's scanning the defense, and now he's more resourceful as RES kicks in, and he's finding the hole. The linebacker's coming this way. That's where the open receiver's going to be in the slot. This is what they're great at doing. I just had a fighter of mine this last weekend get in a, one of the fights, and I have a chapter in the book called Equanimity, which is calmness under duress. It's a really under-discussed topic in life. And usually when he's in these fights where things start to really happen and he's getting hit, things speed up for him and he starts going into the slugfest mode and ultimately loses. We are talked about equanimity, that the best version of him, so he found his trigger, he stepped back, he went into matrix time, things slowed down, and then he ended up kicking a dude in the head with one of the greatest knockouts in the history of the UFC this weekend in the same conditions that he's lost other fights in. So he pulled the best calm equanimity version of him forward under duress as opposed to the scattered, frailed one. And that's how it is in business, in life, in parenting, in our day-to-day -day existence. So hey guys, as you know, I've partnered up with my good friend Brennan Bruchard, who's created the greatest personal development system that has ever been designed called Growth Day. If you go to growthday.com forward slash ed, you can get all the information. But it's that time of year where everybody's trying to form new habits, they've got new resolutions and goals, and you need an environment and you need some coaches and you need to be able to do it super inexpensively. And that's where growthday.com forward slash ed comes in. There's everything from journaling to accountability programs, live messages every Monday from myself and other influencers. There's an opportunity for you to, to get courses that would cost thousands of dollars completely for free. It's incredible. Go to growthday.com forward slash ed and check it out. You're for just right getting now, started, it. like I told you. You are literally, yeah. in my eyes, you've had a tremendously successful career. Same mm -hmm. with you. You're very proud of your career. Everybody mm -hmm. should be. Mm -hmm. But... I feel like there's this next chapter that's coming of Ed Milet that's Thanks, this older, wiser, yeah. this guy who, who you've been through, I mean, l losing a family member, especially somebody who's really important to me, my very important person. to you. I mean, yeah. your father, yeah. your father shaped your yeah, life. He did. And, yeah. and he did it in a way that was really hard in the beginning mm. as an alcoholic. Yeah. You grew up in a, with an alcoholic father. My partners and some of my friends grew up with alcoholic fathers yeah. and it's not an easy life. Can I tell you the good part? Take the meeting, not to interrupt you, but, and by the way, I want to say one thing to you. My wife knew you were coming today, and I've talked about you many times, yeah. which I wanted to tell her more about you. She's like, tell me more about him. I swear to you on our friendship, because you just said it. I said, here's how he's done so far. I said, I have this sense about this dude that there's like massive leap about to happen for him in his life. I have this sense about him. And she goes, I'm going to even tell you why, if you don't mind. I said, uh, there's a kindness and a goodness in this dude that I have not felt from other people that I've been around. And I said, actually, we've only been around like each other virtually. Right. And I said, he's like a massive winner and he wants to really serve and he's uniquely talented. He's got all these creative skills. He's good on camera, he's good in person, he's good behind the camera. He's got all this depth of character because of his faith. Now you're making me blush, thank you. Ed. No, but it's, I'm serious. I talked about this at breakfast with my wife this morning and I said, I have the feeling about this guy. I'm serious, by the way. I said, I have a feeling about this guy. There's some massive calling for him, and it's not what he's doing currently. It's bigger. You want to know the best part? Yeah. I feel the exact same thing. Good. I, and it's not arrogance. Yeah. It's not cockiness. It's not... No. I, I tell my friends all the time some, some of these ambitions that I don't necessarily have, but I feel like I'm called to. Yes. I was given... I'm not a talented guy, man. I'm not good at sports. I'm not, I can't sing. I can't dance. I can't mm. do many things. Mm. But there's a few things that I can do really well. Mm. And I've learned how to take those strengths and take them to the masses, yeah. starting with my friends mm. and my, you know, my close mm. circle and start to bring those people with me along for this ride. Yes. And, you know, there's a lot smarter people out there than me. There's a lot me more too. talented people out there than me, but there's very few people out there that have just the bullheaded stubbornness and the, and the, uh, it's will. We, we, yeah, it's will, and it's, it's it's this it's this. I shouldn't believe in myself as much as mm -hmm. I do, but I do, and I can't stop it. Yeah. By the way, you just explained success. What, everyone should just go back and rewind that. What you've done is you've taken the the unique gifts you have that are unique to you, plus your experience, backed by this really deep belief in yourself and this overarching faith that yeah. something great is supposed to happen, and you just literally explained how to become successful. Yeah. And here's what's really weird for me. That's what I've done. And I don't have a lot of great talents. I'm not high IQ. In fact, we just did an IQ test. I'm fourth out of four in my house. True, I'm the fourth. Four out of four. Four out of four, man. But I am fourth.
So I got to tell you, though, I do have like two really good skills, and I've made hundreds of millions of dollars with them. And here's what's ironic. It's because my dad was an alcoholic, and I want everybody to get this. Most of the great things in your life are going to come through some type of adversity. Trial. Here's what mine was. My dad, I had to figure out when that dude would come through the front door. I had three sisters and a mom. Which dad was it? And I'd have to, I'm a five-year-old little boy, and I'd see my daddy walk through the door, and I would have to be present and read him. Really read him. As a five-year-old? Five-year-old. Is he drunk? Is his shirt buttoned the right way? Is his hair messed up? How's he walking? How's he talking? What's his physiology like? And if it was sober, dad, we're going to have dinner, go play catch in the backyard. If it's drunk, dad, I got to get my sisters upstairs. Yeah. I got to have my mom go take a shower. And then the second thing kicks in. I got to grab his hand and I got to talk to him. And I have to change how he feels by Jeez. speaking. Okay, bro. My only two big skills in life is I'm really good at reading people and yeah. being present and caring about them. I'm really good at you it. You are. And I'm good at communicating and changing how they feel. And I got both of those because my dad was an alcoholic. If my dad's not an alcoholic, I don't build those two skills as a young boy that I've used for 50 years now. Those have been your two main building blocks. They're my two big ones. And they come from that tragic thing yeah. in my life. And then my ability, this, my belief humans can change. My dad. My dad got sober and lived the best life of any man I've known. Right. The last 35 years of his life. So that's why I do what I do. Is so your crazy? dad is a huge inspiration to you. Yeah. You lost him. Mm -hmm. Rather than turning that into a downward spiral, <clears throat> right. you turn that into something that's about to change the world. Thanks, man. Which is wild because Thanks. not a lot of people have the self-discipline to do that, which mm -hmm. is what you talk about in the book is this was one more thing that you had to do. <laughs> yeah, right. And it probably wasn't convenient and it probably wasn't easy. And there's probably times where it wasn't fun. Yes. The publishing process is, is horrible. Numbing. It's, it's horrible. just it's brutal. Yep. Have you ever read anything like this book? No, I, 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 I didn't, every book I read, I don't mean this critically either. Most books in personal development are some derivative of think and grow rich with like slightly different phraseology, like every single one. I don't want to do that. And I, by the way, I love think and grow rich. I wanted one on what do I think? What do I do? What do I think? What do I do? And you put those things together and then I'll just share with you. Here's why I wrote it. Bottom line. If you want to know the power of one more, it's when I take it from you. I take the ability to have one more from you and now you realize how precious it is. So my dad, my favorite thing to do, bro, my dad did not care about money at all. In fact, my dad lives in Chino, lived in Chino. My mom still lives in that house. My dad lived walking distance from my jet and I've had five of them. He's never set foot on one of them. And I would say, dad, let's fly to Hawaii, go play Hawaii. My dad would be like, why would I go all the way to Hawaii to play golf with my boy? We could just do it in Chino. I don't care about that. I care about my son. Never, ever cared about the money I made, anything like that. What kind of a man am I? What kind of a husband am I? What kind of a friend are you? These are the conversations I would have. My father could care less about any financial success at all. Wow. Never emphasized it. But when he, my favorite thing to do was golf with my dad. Yeah. We're both not that good. It was, <laughs> it was five hours of being a foot from my best friend. Yeah. My dad. Hey guys, so I've been talking about Babbel for a long time because to some extent they've actually changed my life. And the reason is, like you, I wanted to learn a second language. I think everybody should speak a second language. And I learned Spanish in high school, but I couldn't speak it fluently. And it was an outcome of mine last year. And I can tell you a year later, I've made a ton of progress. I was recently in Mexico. I was having really conversations with people who are telling me they were impressed with my Spanish. And 100% that's because of Babbel because the way you learn to speak a new language is in total immersion. The lessons are 10 minutes long. You can start really speaking the language better in about three weeks because they're crafted by about 200 different language experts. So whatever languages you want to learn, you can start slowly but make progress quickly with Babbel. Here's a special limited time deal for our listeners. Right now, get 50% off a one-time payment for a lifetime Babbel subscription, but only for our listeners at babbel.com slash mylet. Yeah, get 50% off at babbel.com slash mylet. That's spelled B-A-B-B-E-L dot com slash mylet. Rules and restrictions apply. That's really cool. What else we got for Ed, guys? All right. Sorry, I'm, I'm hogging the mic here. I got Sorry. so much. With all your prodigious talents and your assets and the accomplishments you've done and the people you've influenced, you're kind of it, ostensibly at the top. Right? People look at you and say, Ed Milet, he's at the top, the pinnacle, the zenith. He's mm -hmm. achieved it. He's, re he's done. What keeps you hungry? Mm-hmm. You're, you told a story about Ray Ray, right? Yeah. The fight that your dad yeah. made you go have with Ray Ray. <laughs> Who or what is your Ray Ray today? What, what mountain do you have yet to climb? Yeah. 
Well, I don't feel like I'm at the top. I mean, uh, until you say something like that, I don't walk around every day going, oh, wow, I'm at the top. You know, well, this is incredible. So I don't ever think that. If I, Like, I, I'm not going to give you the stuff that's like, I'll just tell you, I still am afraid to be broke. I mean, I, there's things I want to do. I can tell you what they are, but, like, I'm not going to tell you that I don't have any fear about, like, that I need to keep working hard for this not to go. And I don't want that kind of boogeyman to go away. I kind of dig him. I've mm-hmm. talked with Dwayne Johnson about this. I've talked with different really top athletes about this like there's a little bit of a fear that it could go away and that's not unhealthy to me it keeps me sharp so keeps you hungry it does keep me hungry and so i mean it's nonsense i own this place free and clear i own my jet free and clear i own the island free and clear. i own my desert house i own two other ocean front houses down the street free and clear like i don't there's no debt right i have no debt that's not something to brag about sometimes debt is really really good right a lot of people made a lot of money with debt the last few years but there's this thing in me man that's like hey i still want to prove something And then the other part of me is like, I'm addicted to growing. Like I'm addicted to it. I'm, you were talking about earlier, we were just getting ready to record. You're like, I can't sit still. I have a hard time sitting still and I need to learn to sit still. Yeah, you probably do a little bit, but like, I wasn't born to like sit around and watch Netflix. I I like doing it a little bit, but like I was born to do something great with my life. So were you guys. Like, I kind of know that. And great isn't like every day I'm making millions of dollars. It's like, I care about people. Like I want to help people. Um, like, I love that y'all were here in my home. You know what I mean? Like, I wanted you to come here today. I, don't, I didn't want to do it in some studio or whatever. I want you to be with my family and in my house. So I think that's part of it. And then I just don't, um, I don't have this muscle where I'm like, this is, yeah. It's not for me like a destination. It's like a process. It's the process of growing. It's the process of meeting my other self. It's, I kind of like meeting the new me. Like, my daughter is the one who picks on me and we were at dinner for my 50th and she goes daddy are you in a midlife crisis <laughs> and i'm like what why would you say something like that she goes come on like instagram you're taking selfies all the time i think you're dying your beard now i'm pretty sure you know she was ripping on me and i said Ed, uh, are you dying my, your beard yeah, no i can't get to that <laughs> i can't get firmer than i that um my son's in there laughing and so is my wife because they know this conversation and i said uh yeah, I am. But I said, Bella, I was in a young life crisis. And you know what? If you come back in five years, I'll be in a 55-year-old crisis. I'm in a crisis every year to be a different me by the end of that year, to be a better me. And I said, Bella Boo, all the cells in your body pretty much regenerate themselves every year. Your lung tissue is about every six months. Like, There's all parts of you physically regenerating themselves <clears throat> and becoming new. Shouldn't the inside part of your spirit and your mind become new? And I said, so yeah, I'm in a midlife crisis and I'll be in an old life crisis too. I don't want to be the same person. I already lived that life. I was already that guy. I want to be the next one. Yeah. Now, all the same character, all the same principles, but living a better expression of them. Right? I've already expressed this version of me. The world's already got that. I don't want to change my principles or my character or what I stand for, but I want to express it better. I want to express it differently. Maybe that sounds like one of those podcast answers, but it's like totally legit. It's actually what I think about. And there's a lot of uh, high-profile people, guys like Jocko, guys like Andy Frazella. Uh, Love both of them. B- amazing guys. Yep. They're getting pressure right now since the world seems to be turning to shit in certain ways. Mm-hmm. It's you know I'm not a doom and gloom guy, and I don't like to talk about that, but mm-hmm. they're getting pressure to get into leadership positions. Yeah. Is politics anything that could ever happen to you? The world needs a guy like you, and I'm going to sit here and say, mm. I'm not going to say you should, but I'm not. Is that endorsement not, heavy? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's not, uh, if, if Ed ran for anything, oh, king, king of, of whatever, I mean, I, he'd have my vote. But okay. is that, are you completely opposed to that, or is that if the world needs it? I, I would say pretty much opposed. Because um, I've had some heat to do that recently from people who help people do that. I think if I thought, like, that expression. I, I think if I thought I could do more to help people doing that than what I'm doing right now, right. then I would do it. But I think there are people probably that would rather go raise all the money that I don't want to have to go raise to do it. Um, although I wouldn't need that much. I could use most of my own. Right now, no. And I don't think I that... Oh, shoot. Well, that's, <laughs> I got two votes, me and you. I think right not right now. And I don't think probably I will. But if the time came and I felt like, hey, man, I could really make a difference and no one else could do it, you know, then maybe that I would. Um, I would not run for something small or local. I would run for something national if I did it. But uh, I don't know that I have the temperament to keep the, to, to say the political things that are required. That's why I admire some of the people recently that have gone into politics. They're like, you know, I'm going to tell you what I really think. 
I think both the guys you listed would be wonderful dudes to carry that a baton. I'd love to support people and help them with as well. I can help them write their speeches. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> that kind of stuff. But I can't say that I would never do it. If you'd asked me five years ago, for sure, no way, no how, impossible. And my wife definitely doesn't want me to do it. But um, there's an opening. I mean, if it really was needed and I could help, I might do it. Yeah. So here's another point that I think is just so, it was so inspiring for me when I was like just learning more about you. And that's how you you always talk about actually stepping into your dream, right? The need to actually experience your dream. I remember I heard you tell a story about you and your wife like going to the Ritz Carlton and and just doing that for one day to just feel like it's like what it's like to have valet parking and things like that. Today you have a private jet and like that's insane. You know, you've elevated yourself to a point where, you know, Barely anybody makes it to that point to be able to afford a private jet, you know. And so talk to us about the need to actually experience your dreams. You should touch your dreams. And the reason is you belong in them. But you move towards what you're most familiar with in your life. So if you're familiar all the time with your current thoughts and your current life, you'll constantly keep moving towards it. So every once in a while, you got to go touch your dreams. So like you said, when I was up and coming, I would set contests up with myself. If I didn't hit them, I wouldn't do it. But I'd say, babe. If I make 10 sales this month and I make eight grand, let's take 500 bucks and let's go down to the Ritz Carlton on Saturday night. We'll get the cheapest room there, but I would touch the dream. And so I'd get there like a big shot. You know, I'd flip my keys to the valet. I never done that crap before. You know, hey, Mr. Milet, <laughs> they grab your bags. I used to be so cheap. I'm like, no, we got our bags because I don't want to give the, the, the bellman four bucks. You know, <laughs> now I'm like, no, you get my bag, man. You walk up, you check in. Hey, babe. Let's get up into the room. You go get a massage, honey. I'm going to go play some golf. I'll meet you at the pool later. Let's have a bottle of wine. And so for one day, we would touch this dream. We'd sit there and go, babe, we're going to live like this all the time someday. You get, we just take a taste. And then maybe six weeks later, we do it again. Eight weeks later, we go out to the La Quinta Resort, you know, do it again. And all of a sudden, over time, I'm like, I'm kind of familiar with the valet. I'm kind of familiar with the oceanfront. I'm kind of familiar with the golf course. And I'm like, we belong here. All of a sudden, the more familiar I became with it, then I start looking at the houses when I'm there, right? Then I start playing the golf a little bit different. Mm -hmm. And over time, I'm like, we belong here because I didn't grow up like that. We used to walk on the beach I live on right now. We go to the Ritz. I, I can walk to the Montage. That was the other place we would go after I got older. Mm -hmm. I, I walk right to the Montage for breakfast now. But we would come down this beach when we were kids. i say, babe, I'm going to get us a house on this beach someday when we'd be taking these walks. No idea how I was going to do it. She says, you are, honey? I'm like, someday because we're the high school sweethearts. I'm like, yeah, someday we're going to do it. And when I come home, I'd say to my dad, I'd say, Dad, who are these people? Who are these people that these, he goes, dude, I have no idea who these freaking people are. I've never met any of them. I have no, I've never met someone who lives oceanfront. Yeah. And then I figured it out. They're the one. They're the one. See, in the book, I have this chapter called The Matrix. I love The Matrix about your RAS, but the real reason I read about The Matrix is because mm -hmm. Neo in The Matrix is the one. See, in every family, if you find a family that's wealthy, or successful or happy, but you go all the way back in their lineage, at one point they weren't. And then the one shows up. The one in that family rises up, takes all the hits, fights for that family. I'm the one in my family. And they change that family forever. The world doesn't treat the Milets like they used to. No one's got their thumb on my family anymore. We think different. We operate in the world different because the one showed up. The one. And if you're listening to this, you're the one in your family. You're the one. And over time of walking these beaches, over time of going to the Ritz Carlton, I figured out I'm the freaking one, and I'm the one that's going to do it. Now I literally live on the beach. It's one on an island. It's about an island. It's 100 acres. You said I have a wow. jet. I'll just be honest with you. I had five jets. I've owned oh. five jets in my life. And so you go from that to how broke I once was in my life. I've had the water turned off in my apartment. I've been completely without power, without water, without a cell phone. I've gone to an ATM and prayed I had 21 bucks at the bank, so it would spit a 20 out because all it would spit was 20s. And I got 14 bucks in there, and I can't even get a $20 bill out of an ATM. I know what all that is, but I also know what it's like to touch my dreams. And now I know what it's like to live my dreams. And what's different about me than most people is I didn't get rich telling people how to get rich. I got rich, then I tell people what I did to get rich. And so in this book is the strategies of how I did it, and I documented it. Yeah. And it's it's a really good book. Thank you. And so I, I think a great transition and foundation to before we talk about the book, is to talk about the reticular activating system, the RAS. Uh, we've talked about neuroplasticity a lot on the yeah. show. We've had John Asaroff on oh, and Dr. Caroline Leaf. Love and, them both. And we've, 
Yeah, we've talked a, we've talked a bit about this, but I'd love to hear it from your perspective. So what is the reticular activating system and how do things like stepping into your dream activate the system? You're one of my favorite interviews ever, seriously. So RES oh, chapter okay. two in my book, I cover it. I call it the matrix in the book, but here's what it is. It's the filter that reveals to you everything that matters to you in your life that's important and it proves to you that you're right. It's the prover. It keeps you sane too. Otherwise, you'd be thinking about all the stimulus, blood, the blood in your right ear going, right now. you're breathing, right? So you have to stay sane. So it reveals to you what's most important to you. I'll give you an example. Um, I just bought a Tesla about a week ago. I like what Elon Musk is doing. I call my team. I go, hey, get me one of these Teslas. I want to start driving the guy's car. Next day, Tesla's in my driveway. And I'm driving it. All of a sudden, now I'm like seeing freaking Teslas everywhere. Babe, red one. There's a white one. The other day, I'm like, there's three in a row. You got to be kidding. I'm on the freeway, three lanes over, the other direction going the other way. Babe, there's a black Tesla. I see him everywhere now. Weren't they always there? They were. Yeah. But I didn't see them before because they weren't a part of my RAS. They weren't programmed in my filter. When you go into a crowded room, I go into a crowded room. There could be 500 people in a room, audibly. Then you have to say it loud. Someone says, Ed, if I hear that name, I can hear it audibly over. Why? It's, it's important to me. So the key thing in life is that programming your mind that the Teslas become the relationships, the meetings, the thoughts, the breakthroughs you have to have in your life. They were always there. They are there right now, but you're not seeing them because they're not programmed into your RAS. They're not programmed like the Tesla is. How do you program? I teach you in the book, but I'll give you one thing. Repeated hyper visualizations of your dreams and your imagination and what you want. I have a chapter in the book where I say become an impossibility thinker and a possibility achiever. And here's the deal. In your life, you operate out of either two frames of thinking. 99% of the people operate, once they're an adult, out of history and memory. They operate out of it. They have patterns of thoughts, patterns of behaviors. They operate out of this, and they reinforce it with different people, different circumstances, same life. 1% of the people operate out of imagination and dream. That's what they did when they were a child. The reason you were happier when you were a little girl or a little boy, one, you were closer to God because you had just left there, Two, you had no history and memory to operate out of. You operate out of imagination. So to flip that in your life, you start imagining and dreaming. When you have a thought, an actual thought, it creates a space in your world that did not exist prior to that thought being created. And now your mind goes to work on filling it up with references and proof. So if you worry about your anxieties, your fears, your worries, your past, you constantly find the Teslas that reinforce that. If you've created a thought that's about the future and an imagination and a dream, and you go touch it once in a while, and you repeatedly visualize it over and over again, very simple, I teach you how to do it in the book, you're doing it anyway. You're repeatedly visualizing and thinking about what you're worried about, what you fear all the time. I'm just flipping it into imagination. Then you'll begin to see those Teslas of your life, the meetings, the people, the places, the things. And by the way, you're one podcast away, one decision away. One meeting, one relationship away from changing your life. That's the power of one more also. Yeah. And so with with the RAS, you could actually program it in a bad way, right? Yep. You could be thinking about bad things, talk, saying bad things about yourself, and then you perceive the world with all these bad things that you don't want. So can you talk to us about how to make sure that we program it in the right way? Programming in the right way is repeated thoughts, visualizations. It's associating with people that also can reinforce those beliefs and thought. If you want to know how powerful our, our, our RAS is, let's go back to the drug addict or alcoholic example. You will find a way to get what you're obsessed with in your life. So if you're obsessed with your worries and your fears, you'll find a way to get them. You'll get them. Every week you'll get them. No matter how good life is, you'll get that depression. You'll get that anxiety. You'll get that anger. You'll get that worry because it's familiar. Caroline Leaf has a really interesting thing where she she talks about like a lot of times like our emotions aren't good or bad. They just are. And so whatever they are, you're going to get them. That drug addict, though, think about this for a minute. Isn't it incredible? Think of someone you know maybe that's had a drug problem. Mm -hmm. They could literally be living on the street. No resources, no job, no money, no nothing. Somehow every day they find a way to get those drugs, don't they? How do they? Maybe they got to do something illegal. Whatever they got to do, they get those drugs. They get them no, with no resources, no preparation, no nothing. So what if those drugs became your dreams? The fact that you have no preparation, the fact that you have no resources is inconsequential. People prove it every day with the negative stuff in their life, don't they? But you can prove it with the yeah. positive stuff in your life. And the way you do it is repeatedly re um, visualizing it. The other thing you do is you begin to do one more. In your life, 
stay with me. I have a chapter on goals, which is great. I show you how to set goals the best way I know how. But at best, you're going to get 25% of your goals if they're ambitious. What will you get all the time in your life? Your standards. You will eventually always get your standards. So goals without standards are empty. That's why I teach the goal chapter and the standards chapter together. Standard. Stay with me. You've had someone on your show who stole my content, I guarantee you, because I've been saying this for 30 years, and says, if you want to build self-confidence, you got to keep the promises you make to yourself. Everyone says that now. I'm pretty sure I said it first, but even if I didn't, who cares, right? <laughs> and so if you don't have any self-confidence, it's because you have a reputation with yourself of keeping the, you don't keep the promises you make. You want to build self-confidence? Start keeping the promises you make, which is great, but anybody can do that. But what if you change the standard? What if it was one more? What if I don't just keep the promises I make to myself, but I do one more? So I'm not just going to keep the promise to work out and do 10 reps in the gym. I'm going to do it and do one more. I'm not just going to do cardio and do 30 minutes. I'm going to do it and one more minute. I'm not just going to make 10 contacts a day, keep that promise. I'm going to do the 10 contacts, keep the promise, and my standard's one more. I'm not just going to tell my daughter I love her every day and keep that promise to myself. I'm going to do it, and then I'm going to do it one more time every day. Now you're superhuman. Now you've transformed yourself into someone who had no self-confidence to confidence to superhuman. And so that's the standard that changes our life, and that's how we begin to reprogram our RAS. I love that. I love this concept of one more. I have to say, it's a very unique concept. I read self-improvement books all the time. And I love the fact that you're just saying, like, just go a little further. Right. Like, give it 110%. You know, don't just stop at 100. It's not enough. So I love that. So your book comes out June 1st. Is it still coming out June 1st? Yeah, as far as I know. I hope so. Amazing. <laughs> Amazing. Well, uh, I was lucky to get a copy of it before. Like I said, I absolutely loved it. You just kind of went over one more. So let's talk about um, identity. I think that's the next Gosh, good point it. to kind of discuss. Let's talk about how you define identity and how our identity is shaped in childhood. Well, it's installed in us. So our parents install, well, our loving parents, even if they're loving, they install some of their limiting beliefs into us when we're defenseless, when we're kids. We don't know. My dad, God bless him. I love my father very much. He was a great man. But he would have this thing he would always say to me, you'll get a kick out of this. He'd say, be careful. Since I was a little boy, hey, daddy, I'm going to look. Hey, have a great game. Be careful. I don't even think he knew why he was saying it. I'm a, I'm 50 years old last year. What do you got going today? I go, oh, I'm taking Max the age games. Have a great time. Be careful. What am I being careful <laughs> for? Right? I got a speech in front of 30,000. He goes, crush the speech. Be careful. Like he just, it's a figure of speech, right? But it's reflective of something inside him. And my dad was not a risk taker. Right. My dad always wondered who's out. And so I, I got older and I grew up I'm like, oh, I got to be careful. What are they going to do to me? I, maybe I don't want to make a mistake. What are people going to think about me? You know, I don't want to blow this business deal. I don't want I, I'd worry. Why am I a worrier? Because I've always been told to be careful. He didn't even mean it, but he said it. And so that became part of my identity. Your identity is your self-worth. It's the thoughts, beliefs and concepts that you hold to be the most true about you. Here's the best analogy I give on it. Your identity is the thermostat setting of your life. So in this room, it's set at 75 degrees. It's actually not. It's actually set at 70 today, so we'll use 70. It's at 70 degrees. Outside, I live at the beach. It's about 85 degrees right now. The external conditions have nothing to do with this thermostat because when it's 85 outside, the air conditioner kicks on and regulates the room to 70. That's your life. I'm going to explain your life to you now, everyone. So if you stay at a 70-degree identity, let's just say there's different ones, faith, fitness, fun, bliss, peace, money. Let's just use success. Money, let's just say. You have a 70 degree internal thermostat worth of money and you start learning all these skills on the, the podcast and in your business and now you're at 80. Man, you're cranking. You're making 150 grand. Two, 90, 95 degrees of money. Eventually, when those results exceed your identity, you will unconsciously turn the air conditioner on of your life. Uh-oh, everyone's like, holy shit, he's right. And you will eventually, over time, cool it back down to exactly what that thermostat setting is, no matter what. And it'll seem coincidental. You're like, no, no, no. Crypto dropped. Uh, the stock market went the wrong way. Our uh, Interest rates went up. Supply chain. Uh, I had to loan my friend some money. Uh, my car broke down. My mom needed help. Baloney. You turn the air conditioner on in your life and you got it back. You see it in fitness. Someone's a 70-degree fitness person. They got 20 pounds too much weight. They lose the weight. You see them a year later, they put it back on. Air conditioner kicked back on. 
So the key thing is as you're accumulating skills is to adjust your identity. And in the chapter, in the book, I teach a trilogy of identity. I'll just give you what it is without teaching it. Faith. If you're a person of faith, it's amazing to me how someone will go to church on Sunday and worship God. I'm a Christian, but whatever your faith is, or their mosque, or their synagogue, or maybe they'll go to Bible study. God's with them then. But when they walk into a sales call, they're alone. When they walk into a business meeting, they're alone. Bring your faith with you into your business life. Two, intentions. Give yourself more credit for your intentions in your life. You intend to serve. You intend. Before we did the show today, I turned my camera off real quick. I said, just give me a second. And I just went, Lord, just please bless me today. Let me say the right words on the show. And then I remind myself, I intend to help people today. I may not have every answer, but my intentions are good. My identity comes from that. And then the third part of the trilogy is associations. If you're around 150 degrees and you're a 70 degreeer, they will heat you up by proximity over time. And the closer you get to them, the more they can heat you up. And so faith, intention, association. Yes, I love that. I want to dig deep on some of these. So let's talk about uh, intention. So a lot of people, we were talking about it before. Sometimes we have negative self-talk, right? And we truly believe we don't deserve what we want. Like we might want to be a doctor, but like deep down inside, we don't feel like we're worth it to be a doctor. Can you talk about how we need to understand that our intention matters of wanting that goal? Because if we never really accept that we can achieve it, we'll never get it. I was 28 years old and I won a trip to Hawaii for my financial Mm -hmm. business. And luckily I get up before the sun does. And back in those days, I'm a hundred years old. So no one used to work out that was in the business world. There was like people at the gym and they were all like in construction or blue collar. White collar people never worked out. I was one of the first ones, you know, and I'm like, so I got up to run. Sun's not up yet. There's this guy running towards me on the beach, bald guy, hairy back, sweating. I'm like, whoa. And he gets closer to me, and it's a man named Wayne Dyer. And Wayne Dyer is one of the all-time most beautiful thought leaders, influencers before there were influencers of all time. And it was a hero of mine. Like, there was Tony Robbins and Wayne Dyer. And... God's good that he brought both of them into my life as friends. So that morning he runs by me. I go, wait, Dr. Dyer. I had a Walkman, Sony Walkman. Huh? <laughs> so old. <laughs> and I go, Dr. Dyer, you changed my life. And he had a deep voice like me. He turns around. He pulls his Walkman off. He goes, well, I doubt that. You probably changed your life, but how did I help? And he walks towards me, and we sit down on the beach. And for the next 90 minutes, I watch the sun come up, and I talk with one of the greatest thought leaders in the world. And in that conversation, he said, Ed, you're going to change the world. I'm sure he said that to other people, right? But at the time, I was like, really? And I, he says, you're brilliant. The way you think about the mind and life and business, my gosh. And he goes, and that's not why. And he goes, and if you begin to attach your confidence and worth, Ed, to your abilities and your achievements, you're in big trouble. And I went, what? I thought you were supposed to do that. He goes, Ed, you'll always be chasing it. And when you have a setback or you have a, it's going to cascade down on you. I go, well, then what should I attach my worth to? He said, you're going to change the world, Ed, because your heart's so beautiful. You in, your intentions are amazing. Focus on your intentions all your life. You intend to make a difference. You intend to get He goes, you know, there's nothing wrong, Ed, with walking into a meeting going, I don't know, but I'll find out. There's nothing wrong with saying, I've changed my mind. There's nothing wrong with saying, I was wrong. And he said, you have beautiful intentions. And it was something I knew. By the way, everyone listening to this, they know about themselves. And went, well, I, I never believed my abilities were great. Anybody ever told me, I'm like, yeah, but, you know, or you're being nice. But when someone says, you intend to help, you intend to do good, I'm like, "Mm, you got me there. You're right. I do. And so for the rest of my life so far, I've attached my worth, my identity to my intention to, when I walked into that orphanage, was I the most skilled psychologist or dad in the world? No. My intentions were to love those boys. My intentions were to show up for them every day and make a difference in their life. And I showed up damn big. I showed up strong. I've showed up to a lot of business meetings, not the most smart guy in the room, but I showed up intending to help people. And I've shown up big. So this thing of linking to your intentions will change your life. Yeah, I think this is just so powerful, like not being worried about where you are now in the present and realizing that your potential is your intentions to improve in your life. You and that is that is huge. Yeah. So. One other thing that I learned about you when I was studying you is how loyal you are. Like, you're really loyal. You've been with the same woman since you were in grade school, which for me, I as a, as a woman, I'm like, oh, wow, this is like a good man. You know what I mean? Because 
there's plenty of shiny objects. I'm sure your your wife is gorgeous, so that really helps, helps. you know, of sure. course. It doesn't hurt, you know, that she's gorgeous. But I, I would love to understand, like, how do you design your social circle in terms of the associations you make in your life? Because clearly you've kept some people around for a long time. You didn't just go try to find a new circle. There's a lot of people that you've kept around. So how do you design your social that circle? I thing, like, drop certain people. I've had to drop a few, but not that many. What I have done with people that don't serve me any longer is I've reduced my proximity to them. I don't see them as mm. much. But for them to be banished from my life, I've not done a lot of that. I add new people. And so what I try to do when I add new people is I want to, I want people that love me, but I actually look for a criteria in people that do they support my, my values. Mm -hmm. And so like, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't like when I, uh, I go to Vegas a couple times a year with a group of men, all of them are amazing husbands. A couple of them are pastors of churches, you know, like that doesn't hurt, but like, I don't want to be around dudes who don't live that part of their life correctly because it might rub off on me. I'm not, mm. I'm not, I mean, I, I'm not perfect. So I don't want to rub off on me. If someone is, um, doesn't keep their word or isn't meticulous in telling the truth, we all have that forever. Like he is such a bullshitter, right? You have that friend. They're not going to be around me that much. Right. Um, I want people that believe in me and here's the biggie. I have a lot of people, I have a lot of funny friends. You see them on my social media. Like I have people that really make you laugh. I love people that make me laugh and I'm an introvert. So I like to be around extroverted people so I can just be a fly on the wall, you know? And so, mm -hmm. but a big one is that I want people who don't accept me as I am. And most people are looking for friends who accept them as they are. I'm not looking for that. I'm not looking for acceptance. I'm looking for people that believe in me so much that they think I could even be better than I am. And they hold me to that standard. There's that standard word again. That when I'm around them, mm -hmm. here's a biggie. Wow, are you going to be shocked when you listen to this one, everyone. If more than 5% of our friends' conversations are about, remember when? Remember? You remember? You remember? George Lopez has this great skit on it. What do you do when you get a lot of your friends? Reminisce, which is cool a little bit, 5% of the time. But that means you're operating out of that history and memory. Most of my friends, we do a little. I mean, very little of the remember, but we do a lot of imagining. We do a lot of dreaming. We do a lot of, here's where I'm going, man. Here's what I'm thinking. Here's what we could do. Let's do this next. We operate in the present, but we talk about the future a lot, not the past. Mm. I don't want a lot of friends that to talk is... about the past. I can do that anytime I want. That ain't where I'm at right now. Yeah, that's huge. I love that advice. Okay, let's talk about the difference between self-confidence and identity. I think this is another big concept in your book. Mm. Talk to us about what we need to understand when it comes to self-confidence and how it differs from identity. Well, self-confidence is that relationship. It's a reputation that you have with yourself. Identity is who you believe you are. Mm -hmm. And so they're connected. They're, they're like identical twin sisters, but they're not exactly the same. So self-confidence is a relationship and reputation with yourself. That's what it is. And for me, there's another side of self-confidence that most people don't talk about which is humility. Mm -hmm. I want friends that have tremendous humility along with their self-confidence because humility keeps you curious. It keeps you growing. Only a super self-confident, truly self-confident person can be humble because they're comfortable with themselves enough to say, I could get better. It takes strength to say I could get better. It takes strength to have humility. And so I look for that and I hope I have that. Identity is actually who you believe you are and what you believe you're worth. And that's a whole different animal altogether. And so although I want you to have a ton of self-confidence, you could be the most confident thing in the world. But what if you've placed your confidence in an identity about yourself that's way less than is true? So I'm very confident in who I am. You ever meet these people? Man, that's just who I am. And they're really confident about it. It's just who I am, man. It's just who I They're really confident <laughs> they're right. So they got a ton of self-confidence. They're just wrong or limited than themselves in their identity. And so although I really believe working on your confidence is not that difficult to do and you should do, the real hard work in life is to change that identity. Because that identity, you started developing that thing when you were a little girl and you fed it over time. And so that identity is this thing you're never going to escape. It's that thermostat setting of your life. And for me, it's, look, if I'm really the child of a loving God, if you really believe that, how am I not amazing? How am I not been born to do something great with my life? So if you have a faith, attach it to your identity, right? 
I'm your brother because we're the same bloods running through both of us. But I'm a child of an awesome God. So there's that. My intentions, man, I really want to make a difference in the world. I really want to help people. I'm looking at the ocean right now. I could actually just have my butt on that beach right now every single day if I wanted to. But that's not what my intentions lie. My intentions lie that someone's listening to this right now. It's going to change their life. You're going to grab my book. It's going to change their freaking life. So my intentions are good. And then third, I'm around people all the time who believe in me, who challenge me, who push me, who are further down the road. There's this great Chinese proverb that says, if you want to know the road ahead, ask those coming back. Mm -hmm. And so I try to have some friends in my life that are older than me that have already been down the road I'm going, and I can ask them for directions. And so for me, for most of you, I could be that person, right? Mine is people you know really, really well who run big, big companies that are well-known people, but the only reason it's not because they're well-known, it's they've been down the road and they're coming back. And so I want to know the road ahead. And so that's who you should have in your life is someone like that. And by the way, not all your associations have to be in person. They could be a book. When I read a book, mm -hmm. I pretend I'm living with Napoleon Hill that week. I'm living with Ed Milet. He's speaking to me. These words were written for me. He's talking to me. I've spent the week with Wayne Dyer many times when I wasn't with him before I met him. I felt like when I met him, I knew him. When people meet me, my biggest compliment give me is they feel like they know me. And that means they've really studied me. They've really been in my life. And hopefully when I make an Instagram post or I have a podcast or a YouTube video or I write a book, they're like, you're talking to me. And that's association as well is, 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 is stuff like this. Yeah, 100%. I have to say that I feel like, especially if you're just starting out, if you just read and keep leveling up and leveling up and leveling up, eventually you're going to meet your mentors yeah, that you're reading, just like what you're saying. True. I've been listening to Ed Milet for years. Now I'm interviewing him, you know, because I leveled myself up to be able to have the opportunity to do something like that. And part of that is learning and studying and doing things on your own. And sometimes your mentors are people you don't really get to talk to, to your point. So I love that. Okay, so... One story that I want you to share that I think is going to help us like kind of wrap things up and, and round things out is your story about your uncle who passed away when he was just 50 years old and how that really triggered you to create a healthier lifestyle for yourself and set your perspective in terms of how you set goals and standards and some of the things that you've been alluding to that I really want you to cover before we end. I want to acknowledge you, though. I mean, you really do your research, you know. I do. You really do. You're incredible. My uncle was my godfather, and in my family, you know, uh, godfather's a big deal. I looked like him. You ever have that relative you look like? You kind of look like him, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I kind of look like him. He was walking through the lobby of a hotel when he was 50, and he passed over and died of a massive heart attack. Young family, three children. And when I was at his funeral, I was flying back with my wife on the airplane, and heart attacks are in my RAS now, Right. And the Oprah Winfrey show is playing on the TV, on the radio, of the TV of the airplane. And it's this, all of a sudden, I have my headphones on. Listen, I see this heart on the screen. I notice it. I unplug my headphones, plug into the plane system. They're talking about these new scans that could read for plaques and arteries. And I go to Christiana. I go to my wife. I go, hey, sign me up for one of those. She goes, why? You're barely 30. I go, I don't know. I think I should get it done. She's like, you're the fittest dude in the world. I go, just schedule me. And so I ended up going to do the scan, and I had a doctor who understood influence and change. What do most doctors do? Okay, here's your prescription. You know, it didn't do that. So you do the scan. I went to lunch. I literally got a burrito. I came back in, <laughs> and I'm in the lobby. There's two people in the lobby. This doctor knew who I was. He was pretending, but he was getting leverage on me. Because when you have big enough reasons, remember this, you'll do anything for those reasons. That's my chapter on goal settings, mainly about reasons. So he goes, I'm looking for Edward Milet. And I go, I'm Ed Milet. And he goes, oh. And he looks down at my chart. And we're standing in the lobby still. And he goes, oh, my God. I can't believe these arteries are in that young of a man's body. And I went, what the fuck is in that scan? Right? He's already got my attention. Right? He knows how to present. He goes, wow, come with me, young man. And we walked in silence back into his office. He sits down. He closes the folder. And it, so my information's in that folder. What could he have really done? This is in sales, too. You could just give the presentation, but they didn't create the need or the reasons. He didn't get me emotional because you're always making people feel something. He took control mm -hmm. of what he wanted me to feel. Most people aren't intentional about their energy and what they make people feel. He puts it down. He goes, let me just ask you a question, young man. I said, yeah. He goes, are you married? And he knew. 
I said, I am, sir. You love your wife? I go, yeah, I met her when we were little kids. He goes, you got a son? I said, yeah, I got a little two-year-old. And he goes, that's awesome. He goes, do you have any interest in being at his high school graduation? I said, what did you just say? He goes, do you want to be at his high school graduation? I said, of course I do. He goes, you're not going to be. Not the road you're going. You're going to be just like your Uncle Mike. Now I know he knows about me. And he goes, you got a little girl? I said, yeah, she's a little baby. And this is where you get to a dad. He goes, what's her name? I said, Bella. He goes, do you want to walk her down the aisle on her wedding day? Or is she going to be on the arm of another man giving her away? I went, what the f is in that scan, dude? And he goes, you listen to me very carefully, young man. If you don't change what you're doing, you won't be there for that graduation. There'll be another man on the arm of your beautiful wife running around your mansion. And that same guy's going to walk your daughter down the aisle on her wedding day if you don't change things. I'm like, what is in that scan? Now he's got me, right? That's how you sell, by the way. And he goes, there's the good news. If you do exactly what I tell you to do, you'll walk that little precious girl of yours down the aisle someday. And if you don't, it's not going to happen. You do exactly what I tell you, workout, nutrition, supplements, the medication, and I've done it. People ask me, you're 51, you're one of the more fit dudes in the world at your age, why is it? Because about 10 million mornings a year, I'm exaggerating, I wake up and I don't want to go work out, and I go, Bella's wedding, Bella's wedding, and I get my ass up out of that bed, and I go work out. I've been on the road for three days, I haven't, you know, there's no Bella's wedding, get up, find a gym. And so it's changed my life, that meeting, because he got leverage on me and reasons. You show me a man or a woman with big enough reasons, really big reasons, which are always born out of love, I'll show you somebody who will get up and do anything to make that happen, and that's the reason why I'm still here. Hopefully she's not getting married anytime soon, but if she does, I'm ready to walk her down the aisle. It's such a beautiful story, and it's so powerful because it's empty. Like, goals can be really empty, right? Yeah. Goals can be empty, hard to follow through on if there's no big reason behind it. And so I guess the moral of the story is to have a reason and have it be connected to love and people. Like you just said, I think that's another key people point. People always too. ask me, what are your reasons? There are two things. They're your dreams or other people. And when you think about all the people you've interviewed, you've talked to, the people you surround yourself with, your inner circle, and you're obviously one of these guys too. The, these are those who have sustained excellence over an extended period of time. What are some of the commonalities among those few people? Standards, period. You don't get your goals in life most of the time. You will always eventually get your standards. And most people spend a lot of time setting up goals and never take a real inventory of what their standards are. Standards are like actually how you live. Standards are everything about you. If you're meticulous, if you're excellent, if you're like what you did today. I mean, we're talking about meticulous preparation you did for this interview, right? That's a standard. So you know what's going to happen? You're going to get a great interview, right? You could have had a goal for a great interview today, but if you don't have the standard of preparation, of delivery that you have, that's different. So people who sustain greatness have super high standards and keep raising them. And the truth is, the place they're going, what I find oftentimes, is not as important as the process in getting there. They're refining their processes. They're refining their habits and rituals. I have a whole really good chapter on habits because habits, it's, I had a bad day yesterday. I put this on my Instagram. I use, I'll share my bad days too. I was sick. I didn't feel good. And I said, I did not, I got, my A game was not yesterday, but the separator in life is not who's the most motivated. It's not. It's what do you do on the days you're not the separator for these elite people who succeed long term is they can perform at a relatively high level on the days they're not feeling it. They can win with their B game because of their habits, rituals, and disciplines. As I was just saying that, many of you thought about different athletes that you, you know, you look up to. You're thinking of Michael Jordan's illness game. You're thinking of Tiger Woods winning the U.S. Open on a broken leg. You're thinking of the sustained greatness of a Brady between two different organizations. Those are standards. And if you interview or time, Brady belongs to one of my golf clubs, right? Phil Mickelson's been on my show. He's told me many times, I'd love to interview Tiger. I've interviewed Tiger, but Zach Johnson's been on, Phil Mickelson's been on, and they're friends. And they've both told me, this guy's standards are just, he's a freak. 
He's just a freak when it comes to golf standards, right? Kobe Bryant became a pretty good friend of mine before he passed away. This man's standards of how he worked out and what he did. You say I'm in really good shape, right? I'm in pretty good shape. But then I've worked out with guys that are like world-class bodybuilders and athletes. It's a totally different standard. It's a freak show of the standard, right? So the, the long answer is you get your standards and that's what separates them. The last book I published that was called The Pursuit of Excellence. And I every once in a while I get a question. They're like, why? Why? Mm -hmm. Isn't it easier to kind of be okay with things? Like, isn't life a little bit easier that way? And I certainly have my answers for that. And I wrote about that. But why have high standards? Why not say, you know, what? I'm going to have really good standards. I'm going to do a solid job. I'm going to also relax quite a bit. I, I'm, I'm wondering, what is the motivation for you? I know it is for you. What is it for you to have such high standards? Great question. It is seductive to contemplate average. Yeah. Um, very seductive. In fact, as we're talking, I'm looking at the beach that I live on, and I could be sitting out there right now. <laughs> the truth is that I've grown to accept who I am, and who I am is not that. And I would not be happy. I have this, you know, uh, the, Napoleon Hill says in Think and Grow Rich to begin with the end in mind. And I think it's a great way to approach life. As I told you, I was with my dad for his last breath, holding his hand, actually. And um, it's okay to, you know, every once in a while, think about the end of your life. Because it's going to come at some point. You know, someday I will be my dad. Someday you will be where my dad was. And when you die, you know, whatever you believe religiously is up to you. But I just have this belief, I'm a Christian, but I have this other belief that God's going to introduce me to the man I was capable of being, the one he made in my, his image for me. The guy who could have had the moments, the memories, the contribution, the emotions, the achievements, the times. And when I die, I want to meet that man and caught, catch him. I want to be identical twins. I want to catch the guy I was capable of becoming in my life because I believe that's what we were all born to do is to reach our destiny. And I believe we were all born to do something great with our lives. Every single one of us. Why do I have humility? Because I'm, I come from the same father in heaven you do, man. I'm no better than you. We're brothers. Anyone listen to this? We're brothers or brother and sister, right? And so to me, heaven would be getting there and I became that man. Hell would be getting there and I was total strangers. Mm. And I meet this guy I could have been, the places I could have gone, the people I could have helped, the memories, the emotions. That's hell. And so that guides my decision making. And for the record, I have a ton of fun. I have a ton of travel. I have a blast. But I've learned something. Winning is more fun than fun is fun. <laughs> winning is just more fun than fun is fun. And so I enjoy winning. I enjoy helping people. But believe me, man, my birthday's next week. I'm taking some time off. I'm going to Stagecoach Festival last year for my 50th birthday. I was in Cabo going nuts. So believe me, I have a ton of fun, but I like to have left it all out on the field before I take my break. Where I'm like, you know what? Whew, I deserve this break. Nothing worse than taking a break and knowing you left a bunch on the field, you know, and you're like, I can't even enjoy this the way I want to. The truth is all of you just accept this. You can't enjoy the breaks when you haven't crushed it before you get there and you know it. You know it. So just lay it all out and then go do whatever the heck you want. Max out your fun, max out your partying, but you got to max out the other stuff before you get there. Yep. I love that thought process of high standards and that kind of drives all decisions, your habits, your routines, yeah. how you prepare, what you do.